hate gas masks. My first time in the Middle East, March 2003, somewhere in the middle of Kuwait. At this time, no one was particularly sure if we were going to actually invade Iraq or not. No other group of people debated the topic more heavily than the Marines of Max 1 EWC. And no Marine in the EWC debated the topic more heavily than Lance Corporal Simpson. That's me. Who had several hundred bucks riding with the issue? <laughs> the EWC stands for Early Warning and Control. We had some awesome state-of-the-art radar that could see some classified distance away. Our job was to be the first to detect planes and missiles that were launched by the enemy. My individual job was to maintain what can easily be described as an advanced radar interface. Most of the stuff never breaks, so most of the time, this meant playing spades and board games. Our immediate responsibility as a unit was to assume that any missile that was launched contained some sort of biological weapon and to alert the entire camp right away. Of course, none of this really mattered to me at the time because we are not actually at war with anyone yet, and as I mentioned before, I have several hundred bucks right on the issue. <laughs> Every single day of every single week, for the two months that we've been in country, we had biological weapons drills five to seven times a day to prepare for the very likely scenario that we were attacked by a biological weapon contingent upon the very unlikely scenario that we would actually go to war. By now, I've been in the Marine Corps for three years, long enough to not find it strange to be preparing for a threat or situation that was either unlikely, outdated, or completely non-existent. This is the military way of life. <laughs> By week three, we had so many drills that we'd broken our military-issued nuclear, biological, and chemical alarm and had to use a modified seven-ton truck horn in its place. If you're wondering how we modified the truck horn, it involved high voltage cabling, an industrial generator, and safety. The horn was modified in such a way that it sounded like what one would imagine an elephant would sound like if you set its nuts on fire and rolled it down the bumpy hill. When you heard the alarm, you had to stop what you were doing, scream, gas, gas, gas! while you were finding your mask, put your mask on and hazmat suit, run to the nearest trench or bunker, and wait to be given the all clear. Having a gas mask on your face when it's 90 degrees outside with zero humidity is a bit like having a condom on your face and then manning a barbecue grill. <laughs> Again, I hate gas masks. Being made to do this countless times for what always ends up being for no reason at all completely explains why almost everyone was complacent by the time we broke out the old truck horn. To this day, I get extra frustrated in traffic jams. We'd be sitting in the bunker playing cards, joking around, hating life, with someone occasionally mumbling, fuck this bullshit through their carbon filter. <laughs> because you had to stop and run to the closest bunker to you, the people you ended up in the bunker with were somewhat random. At times, I found my, my bunker contained only my friends. One of these times, I decided that it would be a good idea to cheat, loosen my straps, and put my headphones in. <laughs> it turns out that my lieutenant looked a lot like my buddy Tom with a gas mask on. <laughs> he was clearly not pleased with my music listening. It could have been me, or it could have been that he didn't feel that 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying was actually a classic. <laughs> Side note, what would 50 Cent's gas mask look like? <laughs> Either way, my punishment was to make a 1 to 100 scale replica of the Great Wall of China out of sandbags. Sandbags that I had to fill myself with my gas mask on. Again, I hate gas masks. I don't even smoke weed out of them. <laughs> March 17, 2003. 
I've been in Kuwait for a couple of months by now. I find myself fresh off my shift and right in the middle of a heated game of Trivial Pursuit. I don't remember anything else about this night except the card I drew on what may or may not have been my winning turn. The question on the card was, in 1996, the US military tested all their gas masks for defects. What percentage were found to be defective? I lost the game because I guessed 10%, and the answer was 50. 50. I thought about all the trust building exercises that we'd done before we left. They showed us a video of a goat being vaporized by this gas that Saddam most assuredly was in possession of. When we were still in America, we all went to the gas chamber to test our equipment against tear gas. Since we were assigned specific individual masks, this exercise was supposed to help you build confidence in your equipment. We ended up being a few masks short at the gas chamber. As a result, a handful of Marines in my platoon, myself included, ended up not even being able to test the mask that we would actually end up deploying with. I told every single Marine that I walked by on the way back to my tent that night, did you know that your gas mask might not work? I mean, it's a 50-50 shot. Hey, did you hear? Your mask is a piece of shit. They make us do all these drills, and the shit doesn't even work. It was like a manic Paul Revere running through Tent City. I knew it, I knew it, with nothing but a number to them. Asian, Orange, and Vietnam, LSD in World War II, Gulf War Syndrome, and now this shit. I felt betrayed. I mean, if the people at Trivial Pursuit knew this, then how can it be that the military didn't know this? No one took me seriously because not only had we grown complacent about the NBC drills, but we'd also grown complacent about the possibility of us going to war with Iraq. Once I was done putting my revolutionary complex on display, you might think that I've been scared, but the truth is, I slept like a baby, confident that what I learned about my gas mask would never matter because, well, we would never actually go to war. I do some of my best work when I jump to conclusions. The next morning, we wake up, we're called into formation, and told that the war had already started in the middle of the night. And that from this moment forward, there would be no more drills. Any alarm that sounds from this moment on is the real deal. Never bet against a bush going to war. <laughs> Almost immediately after we were dismissed, just as I was starting to think about all the money that I'd lost on that stupid bet, the alarm sounds. <laughs> All of a sudden, it was as if the complacency of the past few months was a bad dream. All the Marines around me were moving like madmen, scrambling to get all the little bits and pieces of equipment that we'd grown to ignore, trying desperately to remember all the procedures that might save our lives. So now, I find myself sitting in a ditch in the desert, facing death with a good portion of the people I care about all around me. And all I can think about is that goddamn card and that goddamn goat. I'm imagining the goat basically evaporating like it had lost its soul, its skin falling to the ground if there were no bones or organs inside. I can hear the instructor's voice so very clearly describing the symptoms of being infected by this gas. I'm not imagining this. This shit is happening to me. I'm dying. These pools of sweat building up around the rubber seals on my forehead, my cheeks, and on the back of my neck will start to burn at any moment. Right before I shit my pants and lose my soul and evaporate into nothing like the victim of a Mortal Kombat finishing move. I'd feared for my life before, but I recall always feeling like I could at least affect the situation in some way. It was as if the air itself had betrayed me. Now I was hopelessly subject to the universe and its cruel mathematics. It all came down to two coin flips, 50-50 shot the incoming missile contained bioweapons, and a 50-50 chance that my fucking mask would work. I was supremely aware of every single sensation. It was as if 
Every single nerve ending in my body had its own override switch for my consciousness. I scanned the trench hundreds of times with almost a smugness to me. I thought to myself, these poor bastards don't even know how close we are to death right now. Look at them, so confident in their protection. I'm slowly losing my shit here. I'm imagining how awesome it would be to not be about to die. What I would do for just one more breath of fresh air. It must feel like being born again. I wanted that breath of fresh air so bad I couldn't stand it. The feel of the cool breeze on my face and the refreshing, non-poisonous air filling up my lungs would feel better than anything I've ever felt. Like being released from a hostage situation in a sauna and running right into a walk-in freezer made of valerian steel and vagina <laughs> on the set of a York Peppermint Patty commercial. Uh, oxygen porn. <laughs> I'd already made up my mind that I'd rather go out like Private Pile than that bucket goat. I clipped my M16 rifle from safe to unsafe. I put the business in under my chin. I put my finger on the trigger and I waited for the gas to affect my nervous system and the resulting twitch to take me to the sweet abyss. That's when I heard the two sweetest words in the English language echo from the distance. All clear, all clear, all clear. 